Four American anthropologists went into a remote village in Colombia. I was the sole survivor. I stared at the three passport photos in black and white. When the embassy officer asked me how the three American students died, all I could tell them was to go look in the ravine outside of the Pueblo. The place is called Kikari, a remote village in the department of Caca, located smack dab in the Cordillera Occidental. The Pueblo is difficult to reach, involving various ferry crossings, bus rides, and a five-day mule trek through the Colombian highlands. It was here that I had escaped by the skin of my teeth with my life, hiding in the dense forests of the mountains while being pursued on foot. The name is Adam Roscoe. I'm a fourth-year anthropology graduate student at Dartmouth, and my research focuses on the religious practices of South America and the Caribbean. A colleague and research partner of mine, Mateo, was recently awarded a group research grant to study religious anthropology in South America by the department. We were researching different destinations, the shamans of the Chachai people in northwest Ecuador, the emergence of Pentecostalism in urban Brazil, in Tyrami and Cusco, Peru. It wasn't until Mateo suggested to the group a small village that we've never heard of that we arrived at a group consensus. Cucari, he said, pointing on a map of Colombia, his finger landing on a dot in the southwestern part of the country. It's absolutely fascinating, man. I've only read about it recently, but it's a village that is so isolated in the mountains that they were barely touched by the Spanish. They still practice an ancient pre-Columbian belief system. And there's this festival, Festival de la Madre Talada, Festival of the Carved Wood, where the villagers would all carve these wooden religious sculptures. Nobody's written about this and it's not in the literature as far as I can find. We need to check it out. It was the four of us, all anthro grad students, Mateo, Louis, and Carol. Paperwork was absolutely a bitch, as the Department of State declared the region we were to visit. Kaka, as incredibly unsafe due to crime and lingering dissident FARC activity in the area. However, after renewing our passports and receiving a barrage of shots for a variety of tropical diseases, we were ready to disembark for Bogota. None of us spoke Spanish except for Mateo, whose family hailed from Barranquilla. As a result, Mateo was the de facto leader of the expedition, helping us navigate transportation and hotels as we traveled southwards through the country towards a town called Papayan with beautiful whitewashed colonial buildings. In Papayan, it took us almost two weeks to find a guide willing to take us to Kukari. For some reason, almost everybody we went to flat out refused even when we mentioned the name. Our guide, Eulalio, who went by the nickname El Indio, was the only person who was willing to take us. In fact, he seemed almost excited to take us four Americans to his home village. Eulalio could only manage a few phrases of English, so for the most part he talked to Mateo who then translated for the rest of the group. However, Eulalio did tell us he could speak the obscure tribal language known as Kaincha, preserved in time from Spanish influence to this day. The journey was long, arduous, and hellishly hot. And the mosquitoes, oh, there were so many mosquitoes. However, as we began to ascend the mountains, the weather began to become more temperate than slightly chilly. All of us had never been hiking in our lives, and the altitude sickness was an absolute bear. Eulalio gave us some leaves from a shrub to chew on. It was bitter, and it didn't taste great, but it helped to alleviate the overwhelming nausea. We ate packed tamales for five days straight, which was okay for the first day but became tiresome after the fourth. After trekking through the dense valleys and cliffs on a small, barely visible trail, we could finally see the site of the village. The first thing I noticed about the village was its location. It overlooked a massive cliff with a drop that must have been at least 5,000 feet. The village was still very underdeveloped with wooden houses and traditional thatched roofs. We could see clothes hung on clotheslines from trees and children kicking a half-deflated soccer ball around. We arrived close to sunset, and as we entered Kukari the women brought out platters of traditional food, including what I later was told were roasted guinea pigs. They embraced Eulalio and talked with him in Kaincha while we stood there and awkwardly smiled. The kids all came out and began to stare at us as they'd never seen a white person before, which in all likelihood they hadn't. Being completely exhausted after my journey, I was looking forward to a warm mattress. To my consternation, that was not what we got. As guests, 
We stayed in a small wooden house with a dirt floor on some wooden cots that were murder on my scoliosis. The bathroom was just a wooden bucket that we had to empty into a ditch twice a day. Water here was a precious commodity, so we only showered twice a week. The villagers were friendly and welcoming though, and they were always curious. After a week, we were able to mutually communicate using a series of grunts and hand gestures. The Festival de la Madre Talada, which in Kaichu was something that I will not even attempt to transliterate, was what we later found out to be a month-long affair that took place over a month in January. There were various parades with men in elaborately carved masks accompanied with music that winded through the streets of the village. There was a lot of food, some really good, like the roasted goat, others a bit too adventurous for my palate. Festivities took place around a central building which we initially thought was a church. The four of us toured the building. It was the largest building in town with elaborate carved indigenous designs on wooden panels all over the interior. There were no pews or chairs, and the villagers simply sat on the dirt floor. The center of the building was a wooden statue and what appeared to be an altar. We thought the statue was a version of one of the Virgin Marys you would see in most Latin American churches, but upon closer inspection, it wasn't. You see, instead of the graceful open palm gesture of the Marys, this statue's hands were tied at the wrist. What we thought was a halo was in fact a feather headdress. The woman wore a dress tied around the waist and had a stoic expression. This was strange because when you move closer to the statue, you realize that there was something carved around her neck. It looked like a string necklace. We decided to interview the elders of the village for our research. The process went like this. We would ask the question in English. Mateo would translate into Spanish. Eulalio would translate from Spanish to Kaincha, and the elders would respond in Kaincha, then all the way back again. This was long and arduous, but we had no other way to do it. We inquired about the church. The elders laughed. It wasn't a church like the Cristianos have. It was a shrine dedicated to Yuxatuk, the mountain god. The more we inquired about the religion of the village, the more we realized just how old it was. It predated the arrival of Columbus, of course, but it predated even the Incas. Perhaps a connection can be traced between the village and the Muisca civilization which inhabited the area beginning in 600 C. But we couldn't be sure. In summation, we found that there was an entire pantheon of deities and spirits, the chief among them was Yuxatuk, the creator mountain deity. The festival was in honor of Yuxatuk for the celebration of a prosperous harvest and the bounty of the coming growing season. Outside of the shrine, Villagers were already hauling large blocks of the Encinillo tree to carve. We were told that the legend goes that long ago, the chief of their people absconded with the consort of Yuxatuk. Angered, Yuxatuk caused the crops to fail and die, causing mass starvation. To appease the god, the villagers would carve these elaborate wooden statues of the god for worship and procession around the village. There was also another part, a yearly sacrifice, but we weren't given many details beyond that. The procession would take place with young girls wearing the same feather headdresses we saw on the statue holding torches, leading the procession. We were later told that these girls were around the age of 13, all virgins and premenstrual. Men would then carry the wooden statues on platforms, followed by musicians with flutes and drums. The old women would gather behind them and sing sullen dirges and weep, like at a funeral. We asked Eulalia why they were singing like that. He says they are weeping, Mateo translated. What are they weeping for? Mateo faltered, the one that is chosen to be the new bride of Yuxatuk. Almost at the edge of the cliff, villagers were busy carving a massive two-story tall visage of the god. The god had bold, glaring eyes and a gaping jaw with sharp teeth. The face was bigger than the body, and the head was adorned with an elaborate feather headdress similar to what the girls were wearing. Throughout the festival, men wearing white robes chiseled away at the idol. Towards week three of the festival, things began to get a bit rowdy. Men would drink an egregious amount of chicha, a native corn beer, and began to drunkenly chant and wander through the village with a lash made of bristles. They began to chase anybody who stood by watching and began to beat them with the lash. This ritual was said to symbolize Yuxatuk searching for his bride and punishing any human he came across. The women of the village then served us a special beverage, just for us four, that was called Yupa. It was a clear yellow and didn't smell very good. Eulalio was not given a cup. 
Do we have to drink it? Mateo grunted and elbowed me as he downed the liquid. He grimaced. Shit, it's so bitter. Louis and Carol followed suit. I didn't. The woman that handed me the beverage urged me to drink it. It's okay, I'm fine, thank you. I tried to gesture that I didn't want the drink. She insisted. I began to sip the drink from the cup. It was very bitter and almost had an analgesic effect on my mouth. When she wasn't looking, I spit it out on the ground. The culmination of the festival was La Ceremonia, an elaborate ritual involving the entire village that occurred in front of the statue by the cliff. Dozens of the most beautiful young maidens of the village danced in rhythm to the beating of a solo drum. The elders gathered at the forefront of the crowd, eyeing every movement. The villagers would then nod and point, and the girl being indicated would then bow before exiting the dance. This kept on happening until only one girl was left. The chief elder stood up, closed his eyes and held up his hands, and said something directed at the statue. He was then handed an obsidian knife. The maiden bowed her head and approached. I became really uneasy. Do you notice that she's dressed like that statue we saw at the shrine? I whispered to Mateo. I think something is about to happen. Mateo didn't respond. I glared at him. His eyelids began to slide close as he leaned over in a stupor. Carol and Louis also looked sleepy. I elbowed them to wake up, but they didn't seem to respond. The girl then held out her palms. The chief then sliced a cut on each palm. He then replaced her smaller feathered headdress with a larger, more elaborate headdress. She then approached the foot of the statue, looked at the statue, then uttered something. She then slid the palm on the foot of the statue, smearing her blood on the wood. The chief then shouted something triumphantly. The rest of the village chanted in reply. The girl, who looked no older than twelve, then put her arms behind her back meekly as two men came behind her and bound her hands with rope. She then approached the edge of the cliff and stood there, stoic as the statue we saw. The chief slowly walked behind her and put his hands on her shoulder. He then took out his knife. It was that moment that I realized, to my horror, that the statue of the girl wasn't wearing a necklace. It was a slit throat. In one swooping motion, the chief lifted the head of the girl by the head and sliced the knife across her throat. Her body went limp. I audibly gasped. The chief then threw her body over the cliff into the ravine below. He turned around, hands bloody. He then raised his knife in triumph as the men of the village raised their fists and shouted. Eulalio stood up and shouted something at the chief. He then pointed at us, the Americans. By now, Mateo, Louis, and Carol all had fallen over asleep. I urgently tried to shake them away, but their arms remained limp. Eulalio then stood over me and said in very rough English, you. Next, the men began to come towards us with rope in their hands. They bound the hands of my unconscious colleagues while I began to struggle and shout. I kicked the men and broke out of their grasps and began to run for the entrance of the village. Two of the men grabbed spears and began to run after me. I ran out of the village, screaming for help before I realized the futility. I was a white American in an isolated village in the middle of the Andes surrounded by hostile villagers. I ran, panicked, searching for the trails. I could hear their footsteps around me and men shouting in Kaicha. I eventually reached a path that cut across a cliff that looked over the village. As I paused to catch my breath, I could see three figures being held by men standing behind the edge of the cliff. They all made the same sweeping motion before shoving the bodies into the ravine. All I could do was run. All I could do was run. All I 